So, I'm going to get loud and say good morning, and I want you guys to say it so loud that the people online can hear you, okay? Good morning! Good morning! Perfect. <laughs> All right, I'll begin with the call to worship. Gather around, you are welcome here, and you will hear good news. In a world where there are so many discouraging and negative voices, it is the God of encouragement who will speak to you today, the God of Jesus Christ. So come in, relax, let your tiredness roll away, lift up your hearts, and listen. We will have our announcements on the screen. Uh, Monday, the 24th at 6.30, men's group and quilt guild meeting. Wednesdays at 6.30 is prayer time. And Wednesday the 26th at 7 p.m. is the women's Bible study. Uh, Duenna? Pam is going to give the lesson this week. And all the women are in the... Oh. Any other announcements? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> All right, you made my job easy. So now we'll see if that does that again and we'll sing our opening songs. Okay, we'll try plan B. Hopefully it works all right. Be a little disappointed if we have to go plan C, D, and E. Well, let's see. Can you pick up much of that? You know this song anyway, right? Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. 
How great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home the joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art sing it then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art Amen may want to stand for this one as well if you can and, and feel free to be seated if you want to but this is victory in Jesus and it seems kind of kind of backwards to sit down through it amen um. well I heard an old old story how Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins and won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood and I heard about his healing of his precious power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew Him and all my love is to Him He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood and I heard about a mansion He's built for me in glory And I heard about the streets of gold Beyond the crystal sea About the angels singing And the old redemption story And some sweet day I'll sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if I should try this special now or not. Can you hear that all right? All right. Uh, this this song is a you know it's kind of an Easter song and I wasn't here for Easter so um, it's something that means a lot to me because we're all impetuous you know we come out the gate and we want to do right unless you're not like me but I come out the gate and I want to do right and then it all gets chopped up and I don't do so good I don't know if anybody else ever experienced that but but me and me and the Apostle Peter obviously did because this song is about Peter and uh, you know that was the at the crucifixion and the resurrection 
was such a hard thing. These people saw the saviors crucified, dead and buried. They thought it's over. Peter thought, there's no way I'm ever forgiven. There's no way this is, this is terrible. I let him down. And we've all let him down. You know, whether we realize it or not, none of us have done that good. But what's done good is the blood of Christ that washes us from all our sins. Amen. Well, this is a song called He's Alive by a guy named Dom Francisco. And I've kind of adapted it to the, to the mat way of doing it. So hopefully it ministers to you. The gates and doors were barred and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day would find the soul just breaking through to drag us all away. Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window and look down into the street Expecting swords and torches And the sound of soldiers' feet There was no one there but Mary So I went down to let her in John stood there beside me As she told us where she'd been She said they have moved him in the night And none of us knows where the stone's been rolled away And now his body isn't there We both ran toward the garden Then John ran on ahead We found the stone and the empty tomb Just the way that Mary said But the winding sheet they'd wrapped him in Was just an empty shell And how or where they'd taken him was more than I could tell Well, something strange had happened there But just what I did not know John believed a miracle But I just turned to go Circumstance and speculation Couldn't lift me very high Cause I'd seen them crucify him and then I saw him die Back inside the house again The guilt and anguish came Everything I'd promised him Just added to my shame When at last it came to choices I denied I knew his name And even if he was alive it Wouldn't be the same Suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume Light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide And I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried He raised me to my feet and as I looked into his eyes the Love was shining out from him Like sunlight from the skies Guilt in my confusion Disappeared in sweet release Every fear I'd ever had Just melted into He's alive, he's alive, he's alive and I am forgiven, heaven's gates are open wide, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive and we are forgiven, heaven's gates are open wide, he's alive, he's alive. He's alive and we are forgiven. 
Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Oh, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father, for the fact that Jesus is alive that we serve a risen Savior. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you for his presence with us every day. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, we, uh, we know that in our community and in other parts of our country, there's a need for rain, and we pray for rain, Father, but I pray that you would give us a heart for you that cries out for you like the dry ground cries out for rain. That we would want the showers of blessings that come from you. And more than just having the showers of blessings, Father, I pray that we would want you, what you can do for us, what you can do with us, and what you can do in us. May we be clay in your hands. May you mold us and make us as you would have us to be. And may this service be one where Christ is honored and glorified. And we have a closer walk with him. And now we pray as your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our children may go to Children's Church. And I will say this now, since I did not say it earlier this way, it is on, those on Facebook can hear it, but uh, on May 4th, which is the National Day of Prayer, which is just less than a couple of weeks away, our building will be open from 6 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night for people to come and pray. There will be stations where you can pray. And... Uh, I have, uh, I'll have my clipboard after church for you to sign up for a time when you can be here. And I'm also looking for people who would be willing to be greeters for a half hour at a time. Uh, just to greet people at the door and kind of introduce them to what we're doing and uh, answer any questions they may have. For any of you who may be traveling abroad, you may need this information. I'm told it came from the Peace Corps manual. It's what to do if you're attacked by an anaconda. Number one, don't run. The anaconda is faster than you. I think I could set some speed records. Number two, lie flat on the ground. I just passed out. Number three, keep your arms tight to your sides and your legs tight against one another. And don't shiver and shake. Number four, the snake will come and begin to nudge you and climb over your body. What a wonderful thought. Number five, don't panic. Now you tell me. Number six, after snake has examined you, it will begin to swallow you from the feet in first. I guess if you've got to go, that's one way to go. The snake will begin to suck your legs into its body. You must lay perfectly still. 
This will take a long time. Number eight, when the snake has reached your knees, slowly and with little movement as possible, reach down and take your knife and gently slide it into the side of the snake's mouth between the edge of its mouth and your leg and then suddenly rip upwards, severing the snake's head. Number nine, be sure your knife is sharp. <laughs> Number 10, be sure you have a knife. <laughs> it's a little late at that point. <laughs> now I think few of us, <laughs> very few of us, will face an anaconda but we all will face at some, some time or another what seems like an impossible situation. And you'll be wondering how to solve it. Our parents call these character building situations. And today we're going to look at Daniel, who's going to show us how to keep our head when everyone around us is losing theirs. How to face a challenge that's bigger than we are. So Daniel faced a challenge. The first dream, challenge is the king's dream. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So it begins by telling us that we're in the second year, which means that Daniel is about his second year of training. It's a three-year program. He's not even finished with his training yet. And the king had dreams. The uh, King James said he dreamed dreams. In other words, the word is plural. It indicates a reoccurring dream. He's had this thing more than once. And his mind is troubled and he's sleepless. The dream is very vivid, it's very graphic, it's reoccurring, he's not able to sleep, he's agitating his mind and his spirit. And he realizes this dream has meaning for his life. It's not an ordinary dream. This dream is sent from God. So Nebuchadnezzar is sleepless in Babylon. They say 62% of Americans have trouble sleeping. I hate it when that happens. The proverb writer says, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. The psalmist says, in peace I lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And again, in Psalms 127, in vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. I'm told that of all the dreams we have, we only remember a small portion of them. My wife remembers more of her dreams than I do of mine. Do you ever have a reoccurring dream? How do you ever react? Oh, I've had some dreams. I've preached some of my best sermons in my dreams. And there's been times I didn't have anything to say. But Nebuchadnezzar could not sleep due to the anxiety he's dealing with so there's frustration in the palace so in verse 2 it says so the king summoned the magicians enchanters sorcerers and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed and when they came in and stood before the king he said to them I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means so the king had a problem and who does he turn to he turns to his advisors he turns to his experts he turns to his specialists he turns to the brightest and the best educated educated where do you turn for your advice where do you turn when you're troubled to the experts who do you think has the answers to your problems the best and the brightest you go to the psychic network your horoscope How about Oprah and Dr. Phil? Are they still on the air? I don't get daytime TV. I have no clue what's going on. Um, who do you turn to when you're in trouble? So the king turned to his experts of that day, and he, they respond confidently. Uh, uh, May the king live forever. Tell your servants a dream, and we will interpret it. Well, then there's another challenge. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you don't tell me what my dream was and interpret it, then I will, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses will be burned into piles of rubble. Uh, actually, not just piles of rubble, the original means piles of dung. 
it was common practice that day. If you offended the king or in any way threatened the king, they would execute you. They would dismember you. They would tear down your house where you lived. They would dig a hole and turn it into a public latrine. Basically, they'd put a Jiffy Johnny on top of it, okay? The king was sure and certain of the details of the dream, but he's testing his wise men to see if they really had access to the deepest and most hidden secrets. So Nebuchadnezzar is putting them to a test. Can they divine the things of men and nature? It's a significant dream. If, if they can predict the future by interpreting dreams, the king seems to think they should be able to reconstruct the past and recall his dream. He refuses to tell it to them. It's not means he's forgotten it. If he'd have forgotten the dream, then they could have come up with some idea of what the dream was, made up something, and made up an interpretation to go with it. They could have fabricated the whole thing and saved their own life. But the king, king reasoned, if you can't tell me the past, how can I trust your predictions for the future? So in verse 6, he said, But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll get from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. If you offend the king, you're in big trouble. The penalty is execution. If you get it right, there's a great reward and great honor. Now here's a classic example of your boss's dream becoming your nightmare. It's deliver or die, publish or perish. I mean, this guy, when he terminates you, you are terminally terminated. And the king basically says, if you're so smart, you should be able to tell me not only what the dream meant, you should be telling me my dream. So the king is looking at his problem. The, the uh, enchanters are looking to themselves. They're looking within and they panic. You see, the prevailing philosophy today is when the problems strike, look within. The answers are within you. Trust your heart. That sounds good. Except Jeremiah says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The psalmist, I mean, the, the proverb writer, Solomon says, those who trust in themselves are, are fools. So these guys look within, and they're bankrupt. They knew they could not solve this problem. So they correctly say, uh, there's no one on earth who can tell you what the king asked. No king, however great or mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any of these magicians, encounters, or astrologers. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal the king except the gods, and they don't live among people or human beings. They were right. Only God can do this. But they were wrong. God is available. And that's what distinguished Daniel and his friends from the rest of the advisors in Babylon. They knew God who lived among people. So then we had another challenge. The king's threat. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put... King Nebuchadnezzar back together again. And this made the king angry and furious and he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the story begins with the king being sleepless. He's gone from being frustrated to being furious. So in verse 13, so the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends and put them to death. So here's Daniel and his friends at the top of their game. They're Val Victorians, the Babylonian you. They have a bright future, promising career. They're being groomed to be the king's next wave of young, energetic advisors. Everything looks great for them. One day they're on easy street, and the next day there's a knock at the door, and they're being asked to walk the green mile. One day they're living it up. One day they're on Capitol Row. The next day they're on death row. Life is like that. It's so fragile. One day things are going great. Just like that and something happens there's a knock at the door a phone call a letter in the mail some of you've received that knock or that phone call it's a difficult situation how do you respond how did Daniel respond how do you deal with difficult decisions I think Daniel gives the paradigm for help us to understand that now you and I are probably not going to be called by the king because we don't have kings in our country you're not going to be called to interpret a dream we don't claim we can interpret dreams so the question might be, how can we apply this situation? And you may be right about the fact that we don't have that kind of a situation, but we're all going to face situations, difficult situations. And we need to follow the same process that Daniel followed. 
So what did Daniel do? Well, his, his was much different than the other advisors. And when Arioch, the uh, commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Then Arioch explained the matter to Daniel. So the first thing Daniel did was stay calm, cool, and collected. He had composure. He did not have a heart attack. He did not have a panic attack. He did not go on the attack. He replied with wisdom and tact. To reply with wisdom is to do the right thing. To respond with tact is to do the right thing in the right way. And what did he do? Well, he did what most of us don't do. When he asked a question, uh, he listened. The book of James says, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. God gave us two ears and one tongue. I think we should listen twice as much as we speak. He's facing an impossible situation, but he first seeks to understand before seeking to be understood. He replied with composure. He demonstrated great courage when he faced this situation, but he listened. You can watch the dynamics of any group, and there's always more talking than there is listening going on. I have a book on my shelf, at least I used to. I may have given it away now, entitled The Awesome Power of the Listening Ear. It had a picture of the ear on the front. And John Drakeford writes, and he begins his book by saying, Why bother to listen? If you're not convinced of the importance of listening, don't fool with it. Why don't we listen? Well, often because we're too busy. Well, at least we act like it. Preachers are guilty, parents are guilty, spouses are guilty. We're all guilty at one time or another. Drakeford sa says everyone is busy, so just say you're busy and forget about it all. We don't listen, oftentimes, because we're thinking what we're going to say next, or we want to top their story. There's a difference between hearing and listening Hearing describes the physiological sensory process by which the auditory impressions are received by the ears and transmitted to the brain. In other words, the sound goes in the ear and goes to the brain, you hear it. But listening refers to the more complex psychological procedure involving interpreting and listening to the significance of the sensory experience. In other words, one hears words, one listens for meaning. Oftentimes, the tone will give a better indication of the meaning than the words. Am I the only husband here who's ever asked their wife, what's wrong? Why are you upset? Nothing. You see, true listening involves the eyes as much as the ears. Oh, most of us have taken a child's face in our, our hands and held their face and looked made them look at us, look at me, and we begin to talk to them. Why? Because we believe the eyes are focused on where the ears are listening. If we listen with the eyes, we'll observe the body language. And there may be, body language may be more revealing than the words. Years ago, a couple came to my house for premarital counseling. This was the first session, and afterward, my wife asked me, what did you think? I told her what I'd heard. She told me what she had seen. She told me the body language. She was right. Most couples, when they come in to get married, you know, they sit on each other's lap. Not these two. He'd reach out to her and she'd move further away. They didn't get married. How do couples, how, how should couples listen? I, I think sometimes, let me give you some advice here. Number one, set a time when both of you are ready and willing to listen. There's sometimes they're not good times to talk, okay? One time late at night, my wife was telling me we needed another car. My son was old enough to drive and we needed another vehicle. Well, at 10 o'clock at night, I can't go buy another car. At 10 o'clock at night, I can't go to the bank to get money to buy a car. At 10 o'clock at night, I want to go to sleep. That was not a good time for me. So we found other ways to do it. Number two, you need to find a place. 
Oftentimes that may be away from home, certainly away from the doorbell, and you may need to leave the phones at home. Number three, you need to listen to hear the other person's story before you give your own. Sometimes the most profound thing we may say is nothing. So before you set out to solve a problem or face a challenge, find out what the problem is. Listen to understand. Some of you read Stephen Covey's stuff. He said, a father once told me, I can't understand my kid. He just won't listen to me at all. So Covey responds, he says, let, let me restate what you just said. You don't understand your kid because he won't listen to you. That's right. And Covey says, let me try again. You don't understand your son because he won't listen to you. That's what I said, the man said impatiently. Then Covey says, I thought that to understand the other person, we need to listen to them. Oh. And he waited a minute. And again he says, oh. The light began to dawn. Oh yeah, I do understand him. I know what's going on. I, I did the same thing. I went through the same thing myself. I, I guess I don't understand why he won't listen to me. And then Covey's uh, comment was, this man didn't have the vaguest idea of what was going on inside his son's head. He just looked inside of his own head and thought he'd seen the whole world, including his own son. We need to learn to listen. Daniel not only listened, um, he faced the fear. He didn't give the message to Arioch, the uh, commander of the king's guard. He could have. The man is important official. He had access to the king. Daniel did it himself. Don't blame somebody else for the outcome if you do it yourself. It says, after this, in other words, after Daniel heard the explanation, listened, Daniel went to the king and asked for the time so he might interpret the dream for him. Daniel evidently was held in high esteem, be able to walk into the king, be have permitted into his presence, and ask the petition personally. So here's Daniel walking in the office of the most powerful man on earth and looking him eyeball to eyeball, but Daniel's going eyeball to eyeball with his own fear. That's courage. Fear or courage is not facing the impossible and difficult situations without the absence of fear. Courage is facing our fears in spite of our fears and facing our troubles in spite of our fears. You see, when trials come, they don't make us what we are. They simply reveal what we are. They reveal what we're made of. They reveal who and what we're trusting in. Daniel could have reacted with impossible, difficult challenge in his life uh, in a different way, but he reacted with courage and composure because he knew who to turn to in the time of trouble. Now, not, don't, not only did Daniel face his fear by going to the king, but he started a prayer vigil. You see, if we're trusting God, we go to God for help. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery. So he and his friends began, uh, might not be executed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. So Daniel gathers around his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're not just fair weather friends. They're not just friends you can count. They're friends you can count on. They're friends who share a common faith and a common person. They're friends who you can count on doing right. They're friends who will go through the fire for you if they know it's the right thing to do. They're the kind of friends that everyone needs. They're the kind of friends who lift you up instead of tearing you down. They're the ones who encourage you to do right instead of misleading you to do wrong. They're strength in numbers. We need to have someone who will always be there to pray for us when we're facing a challenge. Someone we can fight in. Someone we can listen to when we're hurting. Someone who will stand up and tell us when we're wrong. Someone who will pray for us regularly and regardless of what we've done. Who do you turn to? Now, I know some of you are extroverts. You have lots of friends. And some of us are introverts, and we've narrowed our friendships down. So I was thinking this past week. 
I've got friends I talk to. I've got a couple of guys that I go to when I really have something I want some advice on. Because they listen, they pray for me, and they tell me what I need to hear. So when faced with a great challenge, we need to talk to a friend who will help us clarify, a friend who will challenge to do what is right. It's important to have small groups where you have friends. Now Daniel also seeks his God. Now don't just think because that's the last thing we put on the list, that's the last thing to do. It certainly would not be that way with Daniel. Daniel knows about prayer. It's a vital part of his life. He prayed regularly, frequently, and consistently. He prayed three times a day when it was against the king's edict. The psalmist says, Call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. And you will honor me. Jeremiah says, Call on me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Paul writes in Philippians, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You see, God-sized problems need a God-sized solution, so we need to turn to God for the solution. So challenges are best met when there's courage, when there's composure, when there's comfort in friends, and there's guidance from the Creator, but most importantly, don't forget to give God the honor when God shows up. So Daniel prays, and he says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You gave me wisdom and power. You made it known to me what we ask of you. You made it known to us the dream of the king. Daniel didn't forget to praise God when God came through. Don't forget. When you're faced with difficult situations, turn to God. Ask Him. But don't forget to praise Him for what He's done. Our Father, we pray that you'd help us to trust in you. To know that you're going to be there for us in the difficult times. You promise never to leave us nor forsake us. When we don't know where to turn, may we always know that we can turn to you. And help us not to turn to you as last resort, but as first response. May you be our victory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand as we sing? Everyone needs compassion Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of a nation Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, I 
give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world sing. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Oh, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You may be seated. In preparation for communion this morning, I read from um, Matthew 26, verses 27 and 28. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Before Jesus died, God's people sacrificed a lamb uh, each year during the Feast of Passover to remind them that God brought them out of slavery in Egypt in Exodus 12. Jesus timed his death to take place at the beginning of Passover when God's people were sacrificing their lambs. This would show that Jesus' death is the once for all sacrifice of God to save his people from their slavery to sin. Now we remember Jesus' sacrifice by celebrating the Lord's Supper today, instituted by Jesus the night before he died. We call this communion, the Lord's Supper, or Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. It is a celebration, but it is also a confession that we need to be forgiven. Matthew highlights this point as Jesus says that his blood is poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And notice also that the disciples were the ones who prepared the meal. They gathered and prepared the food and set the table, as we also do for communion today. Every time we take the bread and the cup, we remember together that we are sinners who needed Jesus to die for us. We had to set that table. We needed his sacrifice. But in the Lord's Supper, our guilt is met by the saving grace of God. And as we eat and drink, we are assured that God's saving grace overcomes our guilt because of Jesus' sacrifice. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we for, forgive us of our sins. We thank you for dying in our place so that we could be forgiven. Your love is unquestionable. These things we ask. Amen. I want to thank everyone for coming today and those online for tuning in to us. Um, as we sing Amazed, our song, uh, we're going to be released by Rose to come up and take communion. We ask that you drop your offering and your uh, blessing quarters at the rear of the sanctuary in the tray. We thank you for coming today. You dance over 
the sound Lord, I'm amazed by you Lord, I'm amazed by you Lord, I'm amazed by you How you love me You paint the morning sky With miracles in my hand My hope will always stand You hold me in your hand Lord, I'm amazed by you Lord, I'm amazed Lord, I'm amazed by you, how you love me, how I, how deep, how great. Is your love for me? How wide, how deep, how great is your love? I'm amazed by you. I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me.